Well, good morning, Proximity Conference. Uh, my name's Pete Portal. It's great to be with you this morning. If you're watching this, the tech obviously didn't work live, or the apocalypse is kind of happening, and this has been dusted off in some dystopian rubble found in Cape Town. Uh, either way, it's great to be with you, and I'm really looking forward to the next half hour or so unpacking some of the story of what God's been doing in my life, through my life, despite my life sometimes, and um, trying to relate that to uh, the story that he's writing in you guys as well. So who am I? I'm Pete Portal. I live in Cape Town uh, with my wife Sarah, my daughter Simi and my son Luca. I'm from the UK originally, uh, but have been here now 14 years. Uh, moved here when I was 23, uh, pushing 38 currently. So yeah, a good slice of proper adult life. I'm part of leading Tree of Life. Tree of Life is a 24-7 prayer community. So we're part of the 24-7 prayer movement and we are based in a community called Manenberg, about 20 kilometers out of Cape Town. I'll talk more about Manenberg in a little bit. But Tree of Life has two residential ministries that we run. Um, one is called Crew 62, and that's a home for 18 to 25 year old young men who are in pursuit of freedom and, 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 and desperate for healing and sobriety um, out of gangs and drugs and violent crime. So Crew 62 is for gangsters and addicts to get free, come to know Jesus, and we then try and find them uh, employment as well. That's an 18 month residential program. The second ministry is called Basilla. Uh, that's the, the women's house for abused and addicted women and their children. In Cape Town, there are plenty of places, or some at least, for women uh, struggling with abuse or addiction, but very few, if any, will allow their kids to come live with them. We think that healing uh, takes place in family, and so we say, come and live with us, live together, be part of a covenant community, a family of family on mission together in Manenberg, and um, your healing and our healing are wrapped up in each other. So these discipleship houses, uh, you know, are part of our value of doing church Monday to Saturday. We do church Monday to Saturday much better than we do on Sunday, to be honest. Um, you know, we have discipleship, uh, devotions, inner healing prayer. Um, we've got counseling, psychosocial stuff. We've got woodwork and boxing and surfing and all the rest of it, trying to really hit every uh, part of the human experience in reforming people through the Holy Spirit into who God originally formed them to be. And then Sunday comes and we do meet. Um, it's chaos though. We've got uh, recovering addicts, we've got some current addicts, we've got uh, either pa uh, past perpetrators of crime and victims of crime. We've got people who have come out of Islam, people who are still in Islam. Uh, a couple of manic kids running around screaming, and a couple of Christians dotted around the room. I'm sure you can relate. Um, so that's a little bit of what our life looks like, working and living with and amongst um, the addicted, the violent, um, and those in gangs. And as I said, I'll talk a bit about Manenberg in a little bit, but first, how, how did this all happen? I'm from London, as you can tell. I was working in kids' TV. Um, this is filmed in a friend's um, animation studio, uh, by the way, hence the, the quirky pictures behind me. But it was the summer of 2007 that I first came to Cape Town, and I never wanted to be here. I was a student at Edinburgh University, and at the end of a, a lecture in my third year, a friend came up to me and said, Hey, Pete, I'm, I'm leading a short-term mission trip to Cape Town. Don't you want to come? And I honestly had no interest in Cape Town or South Africa. As I said, I was working at the CBBC, wanting to kind of get my foot in the door there during university holidays. But then, I, so I said, you know, not really, honestly. And he said, and he, he, he played the Christian trump card. Now, you may have fallen prey to, to this before as well. Uh, and that's when somebody just says, um, well, will you at least pray about it? And so what could you do? I had to. I, I can't be like, no, I'm not going to pray about it. So I said, okay, fine, I'll pray about it. Um, a week later, nothing had happened, except that I received a letter from the NHS. Um, 
and that was scheduling a shoulder operation I needed to have that was going to go was going to be smack bang in the the six week window of the trip to South Africa. So I went back to my friend and I said, listen, mate, I'm sorry, but I think God's answered through the NHS and um, I can't change the date. And he goes, well, why don't you phone them? Phone them and just see if they'll change the date. I said, well, you can't do that. And he was like, give it a go. So I phoned the shoulder consultant secretary and I said, hi there, um, I'm just phoning to see if I can change my operation date. She said, well, you can't do that. I said, well, that's what I've been told, but hear me out. Um, I'd like to go on a trip during the, uh, uh, um, uh, on that date. And she said, um, oh, where to? I said, South Africa. She said, oh, I'm from South Africa. What, what, what sort of trip? I said, it's like a Christian mission trip. And she was like, no way. Yeah, I, I love Jesus. I'm a, I'm a Christian. Um, whereabouts in South Africa are you going? And I said, uh, it's a town called Paul outside Cape Town. She goes, I'm from Paul. No way. I think God wants you to go on this trip. And I remember thinking what, a, what an unprofessional thing for a shoulder consultant secretary to say, but I love that she did because that was where my, my, my kind of spirit leapt and my heart sank and I realized that God had got there before me and that I was to go. So I uh, went to Cape Town, had done no real sort of meaningful orientation particularly, knew very little about the place, um, but we were staying in a township um, in... Uh, uh, a small house there. There were nine of us on this trip and we were um, driving every day to a prison called Drakenstein Prison um, out of Cape Town. And to be honest, it was just six weeks of living in a township, hearing the gunshots, becoming unwitting and completely unqualified um, counsellors to a lot of the township youth who really wanted to follow Jesus but were just dealing with so much pain and abuse and poverty and all sorts of stuff. And then by day, as I said, we would go to the prison and we would sit listening to the stories of prison gangsters, just relaying the, the structural injustice um, that really led to a life of crime and the trauma and the poverty and the violence and the addiction and the despair and the hopelessness. Flip and heck. And at the end of the day, we would come back to the house that we were staying in. And, you know, like on short term mission trips, you always have um, a couple of like the intense types. And there were nine of us in this trip and three bedrooms and two of the intense types were like, well, let's turn the third bedroom. We'll have guys in one bedroom, girls in another bedroom. Let's turn the third bedroom into a 24-7 prayer room. I'd never heard of the concept of 24-7 prayer. Uh, it seemed like a questionable use, quite honestly, of a third bedroom. But... Thank God we did because every day we would get back in the evening and we would sit there and we would weep and we would intercede for those that we had met during that day. And I think it was in that room in this little sort of in the armpit of Cape Town in some forgotten corner of this township um, back in 2007 that the Lord deposited just the shred of his heart for um, young, violent and addicted men. And it just made me think, what if? What if I came back? What if I, you know, I got mugged by a bunch of guys during that trip. And I thought, what if I could invite guys like that to actually come live with me? If I could move into a community like that and learn from it rather than just writing it off. What if, uh, Lord, what if the gospel is true and that the Holy Spirit really could deliver people from the power of addiction? And that was really what got me on the plane back in 2009, age 23, to, to be in Cape Town. And I've been here ever since. Sarah, my wife's from Cape Town, and we have been living in our current uh, home in Manenberg for the last nine years. So if you know anything about Cape Town, you'll know that it's a city with a split personality. You've got natural beauty and unnatural human segregation. It's the most segregated city in South Africa, which is the most economically unequal country on earth. So it really is the deep end of socioeconomic analysis, political engagement, but also our faith and our vision and our dream and our hope hitting real life issues. Um, Cape Town often features on sort of te top 10 cities to visit around the world, but it's also equally listed in top 10 cities for homicides per 100,000 people. 
And for a period into, when was it, 2019, um, there were actually 50 murders in one weekend in Cape Town alone. So there's a lot going on here. And it's got some of the most ex um, extreme, amazing, opulent examples of first world riches. And um, it's also got some of the most extreme, extreme examples of um, developing world poverty. It's a kind of city of uh, glitter and ghetto kind of juxtaposed. And so Sarah and I and a bunch of other friends uh, live in Manenberg. We've made our home in this township community 20 kilometers out of the city center. But Manenberg shouldn't exist. Manenberg was founded on the myth of white supremacy where back in the 60s and 70s, the apartheid government forcibly removed, like bulldozed people's homes and forcibly removed those deemed non-white from uh, homes and communities in the city centre and threw them into dormitory style housing 20 kilometres out of town. And so today, Manenberg shouldn't exist. And as a kind of ongoing collective trauma response to having turf violated and being violently thrown out of your home, inevitably gangs formed. And so today, um, whilst Manenberg is my favourite place I've ever lived, but it's, it, it breaks my heart as much as it warms my heart. Just to give you an example of some of the, the gangs in the area, we've got the Hard Livings, the Americans, the JFKs, the Clever Kids, the Mongrels, the Dixie Boys, the Stupor Boys, the Luxury Kids, my favourite, the F the World Kids, I think that's a great name, uh, the Talibans, the KGB, the Ghettos, the DMX, the Westsiders, the Sexy Boys, the list goes on. Gangs... Uh, pervade the streets and every part of Manenberg is claimed by a certain gang. The drugs in our community are crystal meth, uh, unga, which is street heroin, and mandrax, which is a, a pill like a psychotic tranquilizer. It used to be used in hospitals until people found that it gave mental health issues. So, so that's still, you know, uh, smoked 60 years after the apartheid government flooded townships with mandrax, people are still hooked on it. Um, and often we have the army sent in to keep peace during gang fights, such as the level of violence and shooting day by day in the street. Now, it's obviously not the only story about Manenberg, right? The block parties, the soccer league, the people um, selling fruit and veg in stalls on the corners, the gossiping aunties making huge pots of biryani, the call to prayer, the Pentecostal churches jumping up and down on street corners having open air crusades. All, you know, there's so much good, but the reason I, I, I focused primarily on some of the negative stuff is because when we were thinking, well, where would we move to? Where should we live in Cape Town? We thought, Manenberg, wouldn't, wouldn't Jesus live in Manenberg if he lived in Cape Town? You know, John 146, I think it is, says, uh, uh, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that's exactly what people say about Manenberg today. So we honestly believe that Jesus would live in Manenberg or somewhere like it if he lived in Cape Town. And so our life is very simple. We live in Manenberg, we invite gangsters and addicts to come live with us. We introduce them to Jesus. Jesus' Holy Spirit helps them get free. And then they go and tell others. And like I said, it's a mixture of inner healing and deliverance, 12 steps, Narcotics Anonymous, boxing, woodwork, counseling, fellowship. It's not people getting off drugs as much as it's come live with us, meet Jesus and discover who he created you to be. And your freedom as you get free, I get more free because your freedom is bound up in mine. And well-meaning Christians tell us we shouldn't do what we do. They say, no, these guys, um, they're bad people and they belong in jail. Well, honestly, I believe we're all kind of bad people. It's just that some of us have received grace and the Holy Spirit's transforming us. And actually no one belongs in jail, but everyone belongs in family. Um, and so then, yeah, as I say, people say we shouldn't live where we live. But we believe that if, G and good, well-meaning Christians, by the way, um, but we believe that if Jesus lived in Cape Town, he'd live in Manenberg. 
And so some lessons that we're learning over the last, I mean, we've only been at it 14 years. It's um, You guys are obviously celebrating 25 years and that's a huge, huge milestone. Congratulations for that. We've got a lot to learn from you and I've followed the Message Trust and I've followed uh, Eden uh, uh, Project and Communities um, at various times uh, throughout our walk in Manenberg and been inspired by you guys. But a couple of lessons I wanted to share from what we have been learning, and I'm sure they'll resonate um, with you guys in the lives you've chosen. And the first one is, is that we need to choose depth over noise. One of my favorite quotes that I read recently is this, the church is a bit like a swimming pool. All the noise comes from the shallow end. And I think we can probably resonate with that, can't we? Culture tells us surface level sound bites, noisy, shiny, um, upwardly mobile, curate online content, which is I suppose what I'm doing right now, but I'm also gonna be live on Saturday if it works. And the kingdom says yeast, mustard seeds, unseen, quiet, unshowy, but deeply transformative deeply kneaded into the dough, mustard seeds um, buried deep into the ground, deeply rooted to become huge trees offering shade to others. You see cultures mile wide and inch deep uh, measure of success versus Jesus's mile deep and inch wide measure of success are really antithetical to each other. And Christians often get obsessed with kind of climbing mountains of influence, of seeking power and fame. And so the teaching goes, if you've heard <clears throat> of the seven mountains mandate, um, that we are, we, we are to seek influence and transform culture through hitting the seven mountains of culture that someone defined as media, government, education, economy, religion, family, and the arts. And apparently that's what successful Christians should do. You know, we, we, we climb the ladder to worldly success so that we can what? Display the meekness and humility of Jesus. It's, it's conceited to the max. But um, if you read Isaiah 40 verse three, it says this, it says there's a voice calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, which means the Lord's coming. We need to prepare the way of the Lord. Okay, well, what does that look like? Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley will be raised up and every mountain will be made low. The rough ground will become smooth and the rugged places are plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all humankind will see it. So in preparing the coming of the Lord, Isaiah is telling us valleys are to be raised up and mountains are to be made low. <coughs> Excuse me. Doing this will result in the glory of God being revealed to humankind. And so can you see Isaiah is clear the coming of the Lord is going to be marked by the forgotten dark places being raised up and the places of visibility and power being made low. And yet Christians so often are caught trying to climb mountains. It's like the last thing we should be doing. We should be called to a ministry of the seven valleys. Now, what could the seven valleys be? Well, how about this? Prisons, slums, old people's homes, psychiatric wards, drug dens, refugee camps, and the houseless. Can you imagine if followers of Jesus put as much uh, effort into trying to minister to and in the valleys as they do to climbing mountains of influence and significance. Think of the difference as we think about that. Think of the difference between a light bulb, a regular light bulb and a laser, right? So today's culture seems to celebrate evangelism that goes kind of shallow and goes wide, a bit like a domestic light bulb, a nice kind of warm hue, um, but it doesn't really change much. The thing is, Jesus, I think, was absolutely focused, a bit more like a laser. He went narrow and deep because um, a laser consists of a whole bunch of light beams all coming together on the same wavelength to form a beam so powerful that it can cut through metal, it can correct eyesight, 
it can remove tattoos, it can stunt hair follicle growth, just to name a couple of things. So a laser is so much more potent than a light bulb, right? Um, it actually changes things. And where we are looking to follow Jesus to the valleys and in the valleys, what we're hoping is that our part and the glory of the Lord coming will contribute to the changing of things. Otherwise, what are we doing? And so we want to be focused like lasers rather than just this kind of comforting uh, yellow warm light of a light bulb. And that means that the light of the world, which is your theme this weekend, is like we're holding a laser in our hands. And if the world, even the church, doesn't recognize that, well, we're in good company. It says darkness in John 1.5. The darkness hasn't understood it. The light came into the world, but the darkness didn't comprehend it, couldn't understand it. And I'm, no doubt, but, I mean, we get this a lot, but no doubt people on both sides, as it were, <clears throat> don't understand what your motivations are or why you're doing what you do. How do you quantify success? What, you know, wh why would you live there? Why would you do that? Why would you be friends with those people? And the point is darkness doesn't comprehend it, but the prophetic mandate for the church today, I'm convinced, is for us to live in the valleys and be part of preparing the way of the Lord so that the valleys one day will become raised up and the glory of God will be seen by all humankind together. People who before had no time for Jesus will see the transformation the Holy Spirit brings in the valleys and they will be incredulous and kneel in worship of King Jesus. So we've got to be like lasers, not light bulbs. We've got to go deep rather than wide. That's the first thing that I've been learning. And it takes time, right? It takes loads of time. I was thinking about you guys a couple of decades, two and a half decades into this journey that God's got you on. And it got me thinking of the, um, uh, the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, I think it is. It's like 20 odd years after Pentecost, right? So we often read Acts like maybe a chapter a day and think, oh, this is probably about two weeks after Pentecost. No, it wasn't. It was like two and a bit decades after Pentecost. And so if we were to relate the message story to, to Acts, you could say that 25 years ago you had your Pentecost. You had this vision. You had this commission. And 25 years later, well, what happens in the Acts church? They're, they're still trying to work out what does it look like at the Council of Jerusalem for different cultures and ethnicities and beliefs and areas to believe and follow the way, Jesus. And they had big debates about it, didn't they? But I think the prophetic marker for you guys is quarter of a century in. Maybe you hit your own little versions of the Council of Jerusalem where you're working out what are our... Um, primary, what are our secondary loyalties? What are um, the, the, the cultural issues that the people engaging and, and, and inviting Jesus into their life is bringing up? Because obviously, bear in mind, the Council of Jerusalem was fruit of a gospel spreading and growing. And so this takes time. It takes time to work through, to plant and to sustain a truly multicultural expression of the kingdom, not a token one, a true multicultural expression of the kingdom, where we are repenting of our sub-kingdom loyalties, our loyalties maybe to our own cultural idols, like Jews and Gentiles. Jews saying you had to be um, circumcised, and Gentiles saying that means nothing to us, but we're just captivated by this guy, Jesus. We have our own version of that, middle class, white, British man in Manenberg, my ancestors, my forebears, people who looked a lot like me, responsible for so much injustice in the past in South Africa. I cannot be neutral or ignorant to these things. I don't live in guilt, but I do try and live in a generative contradiction to the prevailing status quo of a culture of fear in a divided city. And so we've got to be, and this is the main lesson, really that the whole point of what the Holy Spirit's been teaching me, teaching us over the last few years in Manenberg, we've got to bring together these two things, activism and revivalism, suffering and power, okay? Philippians 3 verse 10, the first slide shows us, 
Paul said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. The keys to knowing Christ, Paul tells us, are sharing in resurrection power and in participatory suffering. And so where does all of this start? It starts in the desire to know Christ. If you're watching this, if you're at the Proximity Conference, I imagine you have a desire to know Christ. If not, then I don't don't know what you're doing. (laughs) But actually, you're in the right place. Listen up. So the difference between social justice along the lines of ideology or cultural whatever seems good at the moment and kingdom justice is that where we go for our peace, our purpose, our health and our healing is Jesus. I want to know Christ. Our starting place and our ending place, of course, is encounter with Jesus. Uh, A friend uh, who works in Hong Kong with uh, gangsters and addicts and has been there for decades once said to me, said, Pete, burnout isn't a Christian term. If we are burning the fuel the Lord has given us to do the things that he's asked us to do, there will always be enough. The reason we burn out is often because we're burning the fuel he's given us for other things. And so actually, Her point was that burnout cannot be a Christian term. Paul even spoke about using the power of God. It's with God's power that that, that I labour, not my own. And so burnout isn't a Christian term, but prayer, intercession or contemplation, silence, thankfulness, testimony. There's a type of prayer for every personality type, by the way. So you might think, oh, I'm an introvert. I just like solitude and silence. Great. Or you might think I'm a raging extrovert. Great. Get a bunch of peeps together and get praying for the nations. But Thomas Merton said our real journey in life is interior. What he meant by that is that everything outside of us flows from what is inside of us. So we, as we seek to bring revivalism and activism together, the power and the co-suffering of Jesus together in our ministry, we need first to say the first prerequisite to anything is that my interior journey of knowing and encountering Christ, of contemplating the goodness and love of God is set in place. Otherwise, we might well burn out. And so as we go from contemplation, we come down to revivalism, as the next slide shows. And revivalism is the part of the verse that says the power of his resurrection. And that is accessed through abiding, John 15, being grafted into the vine, connected and aware of heaven's perspective. Right? Some people say, uh, oh, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. We can't be any earthly good unless we're heavenly minded. Seated, we are told, in the heavenly places, doing what Jesus did. Signs and wonders, power and healing. These are conventional Christianity. It's not fringe charismania for some jumped up peeps. It's God's glory, his holiness on public display. It's each one of our privilege to take part. And maybe at the end of this, if you're feeling, you know what, I don't really feel like I've been full to overflow with the power of the Holy Spirit, then there'll be opportunities for people to pray for you. And there's a purpose to all of this, of course, like the yeast, like the mustard seed, to think, to change things, like the laser, to change things, to remove things that were there, maybe blights or blemishes, or to bring things that weren't previously. God wants to reform what has already been formed so that it can be transformed. Uh, Acts 10.38 says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went around doing good, healing all who are under the power of the devil, because God was with him. I want to know Christ. Okay, so be with Christ. That is the way that we get the power of Christ. And Christ in me is the hope of glory. His presence in me is his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit is what empowers us to bring solutions way beyond our training or good ideas or effort or whatever else. Problems we can't solve on our own. That's where the Holy Spirit uh, comes into it. An example of a problem we can't solve on our own is a friend of mine had a problem with heroin. He couldn't solve it. Of course he couldn't. His best thinking had got him up to that stage. 
He had tried everything as the definition of an insanity, of course, is uh, trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Um, he needed help. So a couple of us took it in turns to sleep by his side in a 24-7 prayer room for the seven to ten days. I forget exactly. It was over a week, though. And as he cold turkey, he'd wake up with joint pain and shivering, vomiting, and we would pray for him in tongues. He received the gift of tongues that week. He would then start praying in tongues. The pain would go and he would go back to sleep. So I'd say seven to ten days should do it. And that's when the real work starts because the breakthrough required multiple follow throughs, almost like lighting a match in a wind. You know, you have to kind of uh, shelter it because otherwise the wind just blows it out straight away. But actually, the fact of the matter is for each one of us who follow Jesus, relapse is part of relapse is part of our recovery. This friend is now 11 years clean and runs a business and has a wife and kids and is doing beautifully. Um, And by the way, ideally, you have three people helping detox someone off heroin. One cleaning the house and making the tea. The other one is sleeping and the other one is sitting with the person um, praying for them in tongues. Um, And then you rotate. And of course, it's worth saying we have access to psychiatrists and nurses and all the rest of it. But those are um, help. They're not the main thing. The main thing has to be the power and love of God to bring deliverance to the poor in spirit. And speaking of deliverance from demonic spirits, if you think of the, the demoniac in Mark 5, he was chained up. He was held in a tomb. He was self-harming. He was marginalized, out of sight from society. You know that story? Uh, the, 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 Geras, uh, the Gerasenes and the pigs um, being thrown over the cliff uh, by the legion of demons that entered them. Well, here's the thing. We can look at those villagers and think, what callous, cold-hearted people locking the guy up, marginalizing. He was self-harming. He was depressed, completely misunderstood. And yet, that was the best the world had to offer. And actually we see it today with people uh, with mental health issues who are dangerous or seen as a threat to society are generally incarcerated and marginalized. It's the best the world has to offer. Um, But deliverance through the power of the Holy Spirit is what is needed. And that can just look like hugs, that can look like walking life together. Of course it can look like commanding demons to go. I think of uh, one deliverance in lockdown uh, uh, back in 2020 where a friend got so enraged he was throwing bricks at the prayer room and trying to strangle one of his friends on our on our home property and it took all night but in the end as we prayed for him as we declared his um, the love of Jesus over him and as he actually pivotally prayed to Jesus forgiveness and for deliverance from some of the uh, trauma and rage and stuff that he had seen in his gang past. The peace of God came and he was delivered from this stuff. He continues to work through it. Of course he does. You know, like I say, relapse is part of recovery, whether substances or whether uh, deep heart wounds. But we are seeing the ones and twos delivered through the power of God. Second thing is healing of bodies. We've seen legs grown out, we've seen sciatica pain go. Um, I've got a whole bunch of stories on that, but need to keep going. But the point is that as um, revivalism happens, um, we also uh, have activism. Activism, which isn't just the deliverance from Uh, demonic oppression for an individual, but is deliverance for whole communities from demonic oppression. Uh, The healing of memories, Um, advocacy in this world. So the revivalists would uh, evangelize for next world focused salvation. And the activists are saying, we want to advocate for this world focused quality of life. The revivalists will say, we want to heal legs and minds and bodies. And the activists will say, we want to heal memories and collective trauma. The activists will say, we want to deliver people from demonic oppression, the revivalists. And the activists will say, we want to deliver society from systems of injustice. Both have to go together. And how are they brought together? As the next slide shows, they're brought together through the prophetic. 
An example of the personal prophetic is um, a story that I love. One day, uh, a number of years ago, uh, a friend of mine who I'll call Munir, he was a Muslim and he was living with me, he was on heroin. And we were praying um, after reading the parable of the sower, where uh, he had basically come to the conclusion that he was bad soil. He wasn't good soil. So I said to him, right, let's, um, let's pray that the Lord would show you uh, that you can be good soil. He said, well, I can't be. I said, why not? He said, well, because I've made two lifelong pacts. I'm a Muslim and I'm a prison gang member and both of them are lifelong and I can't change either of them. So I said, okay, well, should we pray to Jesus? He would show you that actually you can change both of them uh, and that he is calling you to follow him. He said, okay, fine, whatever. So we mumbled a prayer, praying that, and then off he went for the day. Um, he came back that afternoon. I said, hey, Munir, how was your, how was your um, day? And he said, oh, yeah, but I had this, this funny thing happen to me. I said, okay. He said, I was walking down by the, the roundabout on Manenberg Avenue. He said, and five, five guys came up to me. And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, yeah, yeah, but they're all wearing suits. So I thought, oh, they're Kekbrus. That's like Afrikaans for like church brothers. So he was like, um, I, but then they came up to me and they, were all, they all had prison gang tattoos and they told me their names. They were called Ahmad, Suleiman, Muhammad, Ibrahim and Abu Bakr. And I was like, okay, then what? He said, so they were Muslim guys wearing church suits, but with prison gang tattoos all over them. And he said, they told me that God had spoken to them about me, that he was opening up a door in front of me and that I was to walk through it. And I'm like standing, listening to him, like jaw dropping, being like, do you think Jesus answered your prayer this morning? He goes, oh, I hadn't thought of that. I was like, yeah, huh? It was the clearest example that I've ever seen of God meeting someone where they were at, in Islam, in drugs, with no concept, no grid for anything prophetic. And yet today, he still isn't following Jesus. We can always deny the power of Jesus, even if it's working. Because God respects our free will. He will never force anyone, of course, any one of us or anyone that we live or move and uh, do mission amongst, he will never fo force anyone to follow him. Um, and so then the prophetic on the personal side, like with uh, Munir, and then on the um, collective side, the personal prophetic in revivalism and the systemic prophetic in activism and the systemic prophetic is being a sign rather than a solution to a culture built on all the wrong things that another reality is possible we say to um policy makers look we're not we had a whole bunch of government ministers come into manabo and we say look we're not trying to uh, give you solutions to the gang problem but we are living as a prophetic sign to systems that create and exacerbate death, that another world is possible when Jesus and his love is put at the center. So we have, I want to know Christ. That leads us to abiding in heaven, heaven-mindedness, signs, wonders, power, and the personal prophetic. And on this, I've got activism. We've got a voice for the voiceless. We've got healing of memories and collective trauma. And the prophetic is assigned to a sick community, a sick culture. And they come together, of course, in the final bit of the verse. Becoming like Jesus in his death. So somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. I want to finish with this. Jesus was betrayed and then he died a violent death. Betrayal and death are part of life. They just are, whether you're in Manchester or Manenberg. But proximity to addiction and pain and poverty often multiplies death and betrayal. And we've seen a lot of death, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have. And, you know, we, we need to be giving these deep wounds of grief to the Lord because often disappointment and resentment can calcify in our hearts after years and years of faithful service, but also years and years hard up against the coal face of, as I say, the, the injustices that the world churns out. But death and betrayal don't have to have the final say. Death and betrayal, if we allow the spirit to redeem it, will en enable us to be aware of our poverty of spirit, our destitution, 
without the power of Jesus and without the participatory fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. The fact is, if you have answers and knowledge and ability, the world will laud you and clap you as someone who's successful. You can choose to spend your life going after that and you'll be celebrated. But proximity conference, each one of you who are listening to this, if you come to the end of yourself and if your neediness for the Holy Spirit is all you've got, if you long for and labor for God's presence above all else, Jesus celebrates you today. And he says, blessed are you, the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. That's what I wanted to share with you today. Go after depth, not noise. The world won't understand it, but the, the, but the kingdom is oriented around exactly that. Go after giving a life to blending revivalism and activism, the power and the suffering of Jesus together so that you'll have power to uh, persevere as you are proximate to the pain and suffering of those the world has put last, whom the King of Kings puts first, and who he invites us to see his face in. May you have a blessed rest of this weekend. May you encounter God through worship, each other, food, joy, testimony, and may he re-envision you for the next 25 years and beyond. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for the inspiration you are to so many of us around the world watching you guys. And let me just pray. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for the message trust. Thank you for Eden. Thank you for the bringing together of everyone this year at Proximity. I pray, Father, that you would do a new thing, a kind of Council of Jerusalem moment where new commissions and vows will be made to go deep, new um, determination to marry the power and the co-suffering of the kingdom together for the sake of the world, that you would turn light bulbs into lasers today and that you would commission young lives to give their lives to the raising up of the valleys. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.